Thanks, Seymour, and thanks to all the panelists. That was a really terrific session. Uh, really enjoyed it. Great insights and first-hand experience, which there's no real substitute for that. Uh, and it does energise you after what was uh, somewhat um, more sobering, I suppose, morning session. So um, I suppose we've now reached the end of the conference, and I'm not going to delay you because I'm sure people are, are tired, particularly for those online. It's a, a long time to be tuning in for, and we appreciate you staying with us. Um, on that, this is the first time we held a hybrid event, and um, I hope that it has been useful for participants and it has worked. I think it has worked here in the venue and great to bring people together again. Um, I think we had about 350 participants all together uh, over the course of today, so that's a really good turnout. And uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be looking for feedback online as to how you've found it. I'm particularly interested in that from those who, of you who are online, so please do take part in that survey because it's important to get that feedback because I think these hybrid events are here to stay and I think you know it does open up a new audience um, and, and it, it allows people to maybe tune in for sessions and so on so it, it just opens up these events in a different way and we want to make sure that we get it right for future events so please do take part in that survey. Um, I want to begin by thanking the chairs from uh, the first uh, session and, and indeed Emer there, so Brian Carroll this morning for I think so ably leading the discussion and engaging in such lively questions particularly there in that last session. Just to recall, I suppose, what we heard today in our first session this morning, we really set the scene addressing kind of current climate policy, climate science, greenhouse gas emission projections data. Uh, we heard from Laura Burke, the Director General of the EPA, whose key point, I think, was this implementation gap, which has been a real theme of the discussion throughout the day, this gap between policy and the intention around policy and actually the delivery on the ground. Um, I want to also thank the Minister Eamon Ryan for joining us this morning and for his um, contribution, I think, where he laid out, you know, that further context, including, you know, the war on Ukraine and the fact that that's a new impetus to us for um, the need to drive the transition, particularly away from fossil fuel reliance. Um, I think his, his overview of the six acceleration task forces that he has um, at his disposal and that he's been he's been working on to deliver sort of this plan that he has around all of the various elements that need to be delivered in order to decarbonize was very interesting and I think you know gives that sense of energy that we're seeing and we saw from other speakers that's around the system he talked us through you know the steps that we need to do to, to heat our homes to to develop onshore and offshore wind to address kind of that just transition that we've been hearing about there, you know, thinking about fuel poverty and how the proceeds of the carbon tax are being used and so on. And also this question of transport that we've just been hearing from, from Rob there, you know, the importance of active travel and reducing distance um, distances and times and, and the importance of reducing commuting overall and the, the opportunities that we have post-COVID. Um, but, but I suppose reflecting the fact that there are challenging political decisions that are emerging. Um, he also pointed, I think, to the land use review and how important that is, and, and that was something which came through clearly in, in session two as well, this, this question about how we use our land and how we use it effectively. And I think we had some questions from the floor as well around you know, the importance of the future for Irish agriculture and, and the fact that there has to be an income derived for, for farmers um, and that that has to be done in a fair and equi equitable way. Um, so I think these are uh, kind of this idea that we can have a premium for Irish agricultural products, but that it can't be through greenwashing. It has to be real. Um, I also really want to th thank our keynote speaker from this morning, Deborah Roberts, who talked us through the IPCC Working Group 2 report. Um, I suppose what the essence of that was, the impacts of climate change and how it's already affecting the lives of billions of people. And... Um, and how those impacts are really being seen to be magnified in the cities. That was a key point that she, she brought through. And, um, the, and how those simultaneous um, extreme events that we're seeing across the globe are really compounding those risks. Um, and I, I, a key message that kind of resonated with me today was just around how those vulnerable communities, how they're not in the minority. You know, you're talking about 3.3 to 3.6 billion people, she, she, she mentioned, who are at serious risk. And, and I think when you, when you put those numbers, I mean, coupled with seeing real life images recently of what's happening with heat waves in India and so on, it really brings um, th those challenges to, 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 
to life, I suppose, um, those heat stresses. But she also spoke about water scarcity and food scarcity and flood risk and indeed spoke to us from an area which was, it was being impacted by flood risk. So we really kind of got to the, the heart of that today. And, and she talked about, you know, the, the need for system transformation that's needed and, and, and the links to the sustainable development goals there. So um, I suppose also reflecting on the fact that action on adaptation is happening, but a lot more is needed. And that we, I think one of the phrases she used was, we can't adapt our way out of the problem. And I think to our our, our speakers, or one of our questioners points there um, from Antashka earlier, I think it's that point, we, we have to do both. Um, and that came through, I think, very strongly from Deborah this morning. Um, finally, I just want to thank my colleague uh, from the first session, Stephen Tracy, for so really ably talking us through our greenhouse gas emission projections from 2021 to 2040. I think it's a really clear reminder of the work that needs to be done, and, and thanks to him for, for talking us through it. Um, in the second session, which I chaired, we considered how the vision for climate resilient Ireland will be achieved in terms of strategic planning for both the built and indeed the natural environments. And I really want to thank Paul Hogan um, from the Department of Housing. I think it was the first time that I've really clearly seen the interface between planning and climate kind of presented in such a coherent way. I think one of the things he presented was that population change, which is in the, the growth that we're seeing in population, uh, the pattern disbursement and the absolute huge um, impact that that's having on our need to plan and, 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 to, and to respond differently. Um, and I suppose um, the role, the office that the planning regulator is going to be playing, the Land Use Development Agency came through very strongly, but also the need for legislative change, I think, to support um, what, what needs to be done in the planning system to allow it to respond to these demographic pressures on the one hand, and then some of the pressures that, that we're seeing that are required through the consenting regimes, like what Paddy was talking about, about you know, the need to develop offshore wind and increase our renewable resources and so on. All of these um, have significant implications, but indeed opportunities. Um, and it was really interesting, I think, in that session to see it brought together. I think the importance as well of integrated plan making um, and, and the fact that this has been kind of a new feature in the planning space since 2018 was, a, a, you know, a, a, an important point that he made. And, and with the review of the National Planning Framework coming up next year, he, he saw that as a further opportunity to embed climate. And, and I think that's really important. Um, I suppose uh, the, the, the scale of planning activity uh, was one thing that really jumped out at me in that presentation. I think he mentioned 24,000 planning applications in 2020 alone. So that just gives you a sense, I think, of the real, uh, the, the, the scale of it. Um, we also heard from, from Connor Murphy from uh, Maynooth University, who gave us a really fascinating kind of um, downscaled version, I suppose, of, of Deborah's presentation, which pointed to the real challenges um, and, and some of the areas where adaptation, where the rubber is hitting the road in the Irish context, but also, I think, spoke to that sense that some of what um, uh, colleagues in the second session or in the last session there, Park was talking about that, that connection to place and so on, you know, really came through, I think, uh, from, from Connor's piece. So th thanks, many thanks to Connor for that. Matt Crow, um, also uh, spoke in, in the second session. And I suppose that was really around the improvements um, and the role that improved land use can play in reducing emissions. And he, he sort of outlined a three-pronged approach, particularly in relation to forestry, which was around kind of protecting what we have planting more and then managing our peatlands and our, our organic soils. And I mean, I think those three, that three-pronged approach, I mean, it sounds fairly simplistic in reality. We know it's incredibly complex, but, but nonetheless, I think useful to have it summarized in that, in that way. And then finally, we heard from, from Ken Cleary from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform on how the NDP is reflecting climate priorities. And I'm really interested to see that analysis that was undertaken to inform the NDP uh, prior to publication and, and how it was um, climate proofed in, 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 in essence and, and also the structural changes that are happening in that department. Uh, and I know that's not isolated. There's a commitment in the Climate Action Plan that there'll be a climate action unit established in every government department. And, and what we're seeing, I think the outcome of that should be a much more systemic approach to tackling climate change. So really good to see that come into life from one of our speakers today. So thanks to them all for their contributions. And we've just finished the third session, so I, I, won't, I won't go back over it, but it really, I think this the essence of it was focusing on the scale and the pace of change needed to 
achieve climate neutrality and climate resilience. And I suppose the first hand insights, you just can't beat them. And we had some terrific speakers. So we're really, really grateful. Um, and it really does give us that sense of just the complexity of the challenge that lies ahead um, and the, the, the work that's needed, like it's down into the trenches, I think, what's, is what's really needed. And I think even just, Robert, your description of having to um, come up with a policy or come up with a way of doing it and be responsive um, and not responsive over an extended period, like immediately responsive and that, that's how you help bring people with you. Um, I think I think that's that's really interesting, and you know, just to re to recall, I think Paddy Hayes's excellent uh, contribution as our keynote speaker. I mean, the progress made to date um, on reducing the carbon intensity of the electricity supply has really been something that we should be very proud of in this country, um, and the plans for the future, as is outlined, are extremely ambitious. You know, and the need for storage and hydrogen and so on, it is a, it is a, 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 a huge challenge that faces us. Um, and, and, and even even from the point of view of the ESB and the, the the recruitment drive, which is underway to try and help address that, it just gives you a sense of that complexity of that challenge. So, look. I'm not going to, to, to recall the other speakers because we, we've, we've just been through it, but I think you'll all agree that we've had a really rich suite of presentations here today, some really tremendous speakers who've given us a lot of food for thought, and I hope uh, that others are like me and feel kind of energised. I think it's great to come together with people who are all trying to work on the same issue and ultimately try to reduce our overall greenhouse gas emissions, where we started the discussion this morning. That is the name of the game, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions while coping with the uh, the impacts of, of the emissions that have already taken to play, place to date and making sure that we don't leave people behind in the process. So that draws our conference to a close. I want to finally, once again, thank everybody for your attendance. Um, you can access some of the material that we referenced here today on the conference platform, which will still be live afterwards, and just a reminder to everybody to fill out the survey. And with that, I'll close the conference. Thank you.